Stay connected to the world with Channels TV podcast and get all the trending stories. Simply log on to channelstv.com, click on podcast, select the program of your choice and listen. Our podcast is available on Apple, Google and Spotify. Tap the expertise you trust. Touch the stories that touch you anytime, anywhere. The Ninth House of Representatives has invited stakeholders for a conversation on policing and human rights in Nigeria. The dialogue takes a look at the proposed bill for the Police Service Commission, whose responsibility it is to sanction erring police officers. What we are about to discuss here is very important because in that act, there have not been any provision for any erring police officer who have goes beyond his core mandate. There have not been provision for sanction. This dialogue is an innovative step in the bill-making process. It is aimed at introducing stakeholder ownership of the legislative process. In emphasizing the need for police reforms, the UNDP resident representative to Nigeria and the Speaker of the House of Representatives speak on the disconnect between the citizens and the police. If you ask or talk to many citizens, which I've been had an opportunity to engage recently, there's a huge deficit in police and policing in Nigeria. We do not have an effective system of policing when the relationships between communities and the police are defined by fear and mistrust. We want to help them be better public servants by making it easier to remove rogue officers from amongst their midst because bad police make it impossible for good police to do their work. One of the points at the technical session of the event is human rights violation by the police. Orientation is being addressed. So the, the intent, Mr. Speaker, is to give powers to the Police Service Commission to intervene even at the level of curriculum so that we are turning around their mindset even from the get-go when they get into the police force to understand what the Constitution provides, to understand what the rights of citizens are. If I write a petition today against the MBA president that he's involved in an armed robbery in my village. The first mode of operation will be to arrest the MBA president before investigation starts. What does that tell you? That he's actually guilty. He now has to prove himself innocent. The speaker bears his thoughts on the appearance of some policemen. Shed out, sometimes rubber sleepers probably very unkempt. It's kind of very difficult to look at him with the respect and authority of state. A public hearing will still be held on the proposed bill after it scales second reading in the House of Representatives. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. So that conversation happened yesterday about policing and human rights, you know, something that uh, was done uh, in collaboration with the House of Representatives, even led by the House of Representatives and the Speaker was himself there. But we have had police reforms in Nigeria since 1966. Look at this one, for instance, on the screen right now. This has happened, and the report was submitted to General Gowon recommending abolition of local police at the time. Mm. That was in 1966. Oh, yes, you recall that's when we now had one police force, in some sense, having the different regions' police coming together. Which was after, that, that was before or after the Civil War? It was before the Civil War. Oh, yeah, it was, it was during that period. So yeah. it was a time that the police had a lot of responsibility. Yes, the war was fought by the military, but they also had 
of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But take a look at what happened in 1989. There was that Admiral Myrtle and Yako Reform Committee, which was established by the government to address rising cases of insecurity. And what you'll expect is after that kind of reform, insecurity should reduce, but not quite. Mm. The reforms were implemented, but insecurity increased. Perhaps then asks the, underscores the question of the reforms and um, how long-term, how visionary mm. those reports were in the first place. In 1994, then head of state, uh, now late General Sonia Bacha, inaugurated a six-man panel headed by former Inspector General of Police, MD Yusufu, um, still on the same place. The report was never published and, of course, naturally, never implemented. Oh, fast forward to 2006. So we thought, you know what, we could do this. So the Presidential Committee on Police Reform was constituted by former President Olushe Gwambasajo. And what came out of it was a white paper which was approved by the government. But uh, a lot of people think that was not substantially implemented. Yet again, implementation. Where, which, I mean, uh, again, it goes back to, okay, so how long term was the thinking? 2012, no, no, let me take it to 2008, two years after that one, a presidential committee headed by Mohammed D. Yusuf, um, a retired IGP. He, that's the second one he seems oh, yes. to be, you know, leading there. It was constituted in January by former president, later uh, President Yaradua. Reforms were attempted, but deemed uncoordinated. Again, implementation. Yeah. And eight years ago, the presidential committee, which was chaired by Pari Asoyade, a retired DIG and chairman of a PSC at that time. Well, the committee submitted its report, but we didn't get to see the white paper. And consequently, no implementation. Well, we have had police reforms. That's the meat of the matter. How far so far? Another attempt at that is the Police Act 2020 which has made far-reaching recommendations in the law. However, is it active yet? If not, why? The president has signed it. Gazetting, what's holding it up? Then that committee, that uh, meeting that happened yesterday is actually why we are here this morning to have a conversation with two gentlemen. Um, uh, you saw some of them, the two of them in the opening slide. Honorable Henry Owauba, Chairman, Committee on Implementation and Monitoring of legislative agenda in the House of, of Representatives. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Honorable. We also have a youth thank advocate. You yes, thank you. And uh, uh, Nigerian entertainer, uh, Michael Stevens. We all know him as Rugged Man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Honorable, um, let's begin with you. Uh, give us a backstory to that meeting that took place yesterday in Abuja about policing and human rights. Uh, very good morning. Um, so first of all, to establish that the meeting that took place yesterday was driven by the House Committee uh, on the implementation uh, and monitoring of the legislative agenda of the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, if you recall, in October last year, the House had set out an agenda for itself that it would be pursuing for the life of this assembly. And upon the advent of the COVID pandemic, um, the House reconvened in, Feb in, March, in, in March to rework that document and come up with an updated agenda that looked at 10 critical sectors of uh, the economy, with the security being one of them. Uh, this was before the NSAS uh, uprising. And what we have done is that because we're living in a very dynamic, uh, you know, very, very uh, different times, we are looking at the issues that are arising in this country. If you remember that the uh, part three, uh, section 30, A and B of the 1999 constitution, the Police Service Commission actually has the authority to recruit uh, and to also look at um, disciplinary issues in the Nigerian police force. Uh, essentially, the objective what we're looking at now is to see how we can establish a more effective and a, perhaps a responsive framework that will conduct the, uh, the that will govern the operations of police in, in, in Nigeria. And then, of course, uh, secondly, 
look at the, the, the structure and composition of the board of the Police Service Commission and, uh, and hopefully dovetail into the operations on ground, especially when it comes to human rights abuses uh, in terms of uh, the way uh, complaints are laid, the way they are acted upon and the time frame they have to conclude investigations. All of that has happened and um, there are still a good number of questions to ask. So that led to the meeting of yesterday. But then that's not the first of it that we have had over time. You have, must have listened to the intro that we gave of a number of uh, police reforms that we have had since 1966 until today. And yet what has been consistent in all of it is implementation of the reports of such meetings, such investigations, such um, attempts at reforming the police. What hopes do we have that this will be any different? Okay, so for the first time, uh, we're actually tracking the things that we set out to achieve for ourselves. Um, you know, the bill making uh, or lawmaking cycle usually starts from when a bill is listed on the floor for first reading. What we're doing now is we're expanding this process. Uh, what we've actually had is a zero draft. Uh, it's not a bill yet. What we're trying to do is get every relevant person on board to stop this uh, trend of completing an exercise and then it, it ends up being an exercise in futility. So we are essentially con you know, talking with all these relevant stakeholders so that when the train moves and we start with the bill making on this uh, reform, we're not going to look back. We're not going to leave anything to chance. Everything would have been uh, considered. All relevant opinions would have been taken. And then it would sail, get a presidential uh, accent and become law. We believe that we will never get tired of, of uh, you know, engaging. This is what we do as parliament. Uh, this is what we're elected to do. We're elected to interrogate uh, status quo. We're elected to ask questions. We will continue to do the work. Uh, there will be challenges, but it, it's not going to deter us. On this uh, zero draft that we have, we have put together a crack team of stakeholders, of professionals. We have the Nigerian Bar Association. We have the Human Rights Commission. We're working with the Police Service Commission itself. And all of these intake, all of these input are aimed at getting together a draft that would carry the, uh, or aggregate the collective thoughts of the people that, are, that matter in this conversation. So that when we start to make the law, we know that we have something that is already carrying everybody, everybody's opinion. Uh, we believe that this is going to be different. We believe that it's going to be signed. Uh, we believe that uh, it's, it's a bill whose time has come. It's necessary. If you look at what's happening in the country today, uh, the, the, the issues of human rights are, are germane. Um, people have said to us that if, if you take the Nigerian policeman on international duties, uh, you see that him excelling. But when you put the same policeman in Nigeria, um, there are gaps and there are questions. And so what seems to be the problem? These are some of the things that we need to look at and we need to continuously engage ourselves in the lawmaking process, especially with the people that we oversight. Because ultimately, we believe that a very good police force is one of the critical things needed in this country to maintain a certain level of decency in the system. Uh, Honourable, uh, this whole conversation about uh, human rights, you know, increased now uh, as a result of um, issues raised by young people in the country. So far, I haven't heard you say how, what kind of interventions, what kind of conversations, what kind of engagement you are having with the young generation in the country who you know make up some 60 to 70 percent of Nigeria's population. Let's look at the, 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 the procedure. Let's look at, we'll start from the composition of the Police Service Commission. The Constitution actually provides for a nine-member board. We will activate the full uh, the membership of the board, and we're going to bring in people that are stakeholders in human rights and policing activities in Nigeria. Uh, groups like the Nigerian Bar Association will now be on the board of the Police Service Commission. 
the Human Rights Commission itself will be on the board. Even the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission, ICPC, we're proposing a board chairman that would, uh, his tenure will be for a fixed term of five years. So he's going to be f uh, fixed and he will not be distracted with looking for re uh, reappointment. And of course, there's going to be a woman on the board and it must be a woman that is vested and well uh, um, knowledgeable about domestic violence and violence against women. And of course, uh, when you, you come to the police complaints procedure itself, what we're looking at now is a way that the Police Service Commission will have representatives uh, or offices in the 30, 36 states. Um, we're looking at a, a, a complaints procedure that would not necessarily rely on the police force itself. It, it, it will be a situation where you can imagine the kind of uh, um, justice you will get if you go to a police service where the, the officer that is accused of uh, human rights violation is the same police station where you go to turn in your complaint. What we're saying is that the Police Service Commission should be able to coordinate the process of uh, collecting all the, um, uh, the human rights violations and then obviously go through a process of investigation. And while that investigation is going on, the, uh, the police officer that is being accused of whatever the violations are will be removed from customer facing duties and put on a back office role, maybe a desk duty, remove the gun. You don't empower a policeman who has been accused of human rights violation uh, uh, and still keep him on the beat. But the critical thing to point out is that this bill is actually going to be, in terms of the mode of engagement, it's going to be a bill that will be good for the police and also for the accusers, for the citizens. We are looking at a fair process that will protect the policeman while investigations are going on and also give confidence to the complainants that, look, this system is going to be transparent, it's going to be outside of the police control, and there will be a recommendation at the end. It's not just looking at the young people of Nigeria. I think that uh, human rights violations cut across. We have elders, we have politicians, we have pressmen, we have the youth, we have everybody in Nigeria has uh, at one time, or hopefully this bill would be actually something that we're putting in for Nigerians, regardless of whether they're youths or whether they're, as long as you're a Nigerian, this bill seeks to protect you from human rights abuses from the police. Clearly, this sounds like a marathon, not a sprint, because for a lot of people, they're thinking, how soon can we get those wins? But let's bring this back uh, to Lagos. Uh, join Rugged Man, Mr. Stevens. I, I know you did the song, This Police Your Friend. Yes, uh, I did. And for a lot of young Nigerians, uh, they see you as that, that link between themselves and the police. In fact, some say you're probably an ambassador, but you've since said, <laughs> said you're not an ambassador. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, seeing what the House of Representatives is trying to achieve, you've probably seen the judicial panels all across. You've seen the way the president has responded, the vice president. I mean, aggregating all of this together, do you think this is what the police needs to become the friend of a Nigerian? On paper, yes. On paper, yes. All I've heard right now sounds really good. But on the streets right now, no. Mm. What people need right now, especially the youth, yes, he just said, um, the Honorable just said it's not um, just the youth, it's uh, even politicians, and I'd really love for him to show me a politician that's been manhandled by the police. But um, the youth are the people who face these policemen on the streets every day, especially because a lot of them do not have jobs. So they get to move around a lot, you understand? So what people need right now is less talk and more action. For me, to, sorry to sound like a radio station. You know, what people need is less talk and more action. Because as I speak to you, okay, we know the situation the country is in. We know what we're just recovering from the NSARS protest and everything. And unfortunately, uh, I, I need to point out something. It's not just SARS. It's not just SARS. There's also anti-kidnapping, then there's anti-courtism. These are uh, two other squads that were doing the same thing. It's just unfortunate that SARS was the most popular. So everybody picks on SARS. You know, so when they say NSARS, NSARS, right now, I feel the anti-courtism, anti-kidnapping are just hiding somewhere, hoping we don't remember them. But we remember you. You were part of this 
problem. You understand? So what the people need is, yes, I'm okay with the panels being set up, but panels have been set. You already you started from 1960, what? 66. Right? To this is 2020. Uh, you know, the, the, the question I would also like, like to ask you is, I know you've interfaced a lot of times I, I between remember. young people and the police. And yes, we go back to 1966. Some will tell you it started way before then. I mean, mm -hmm. when the colonial masters and court came, introduced this, and then there were issues. But why does it seem as though the Nigerian police force has defied reforms over the years? How hard really is it to reform the Nigeria police? It's not hard. Anything that seems to defy reform, it only means that there are some people high up somewhere that are benefiting from the chaos, that are benefiting from the crimes being committed. So until you remove those people, there will probably be no reform because they will be the ones always kicking against any type of reform that will stop them getting the monies they get. That's why I said people need more action than talk. Right now, as we speak, we know what we're just trying to recover from. Two days ago, that was from the whole police brutality and everything. Then two days ago, I saw videos of task force and Okada riders at mile two. And then yesterday, I saw the video, another video of task force against Okada riders in Ikeja along. And I posted it yesterday and said, with the situation of the country right now, is this the right time to be engaging Okada riders who are among the people that have been brutalized, extorted, who are hungry, who are angry. But you won't also take it away, rugged man, that, mm -hmm. you know, in every society, we always have people who want to take advantage of the system, defy yeah. the authorities and stuff like that. And that's, okay. okay. You, you know, of course, that there are times when these Okada riders, for instance, just for instance, mm -hmm. they drive against traffic a good number mm -hmm. of times. They, you know, defy the laws of the land, they do things that they are not supposed to do and which has resulted in, in them being taken away from major highways and certain yeah. areas of the country and okay. stuff like that, which is the reason perhaps why the task force is asking them to get off, off the places or areas where they have been taken away from. Okay. So in that light, one wouldn't say that the task force is doing the wrong thing when they are only trying to enforce the law. Uh, look at it this way. We need to be smart in everything we, we, we're doing in life. We need to have empathy. And then one thing I always tell the police and I tell the people, especially the police because they are the authorities, communication is key. Communication is key. Do these bike men know what they're doing wrong? Mm -hmm. Hold on. Why I'm saying this is because I can't walk up to you and just do an Okada man. His Okada is everything. is his life. Once he sees a uniformed officer coming towards him, he's losing money or he's losing his bike that day. God forbid, with the way things have been going, he's losing his life. So as far as he's concerned, he will do anything to protect his bike. Now, what we need is communication between the task force, the police, and the people. You need to enlighten these people. You need to let them know. And look, we don't have to wait until uh, campaign periods before we start running adverts on TV and on radio telling people how to vote and where to vote. You can also run campaigns telling Okada men, bus drivers, where to go to and where not to go to. Okay, let me talk to, take you up on a constituency you are, you know, as passionate about, which is the youth. Um, you've heard the Honourable say some things about, you know, what government is doing, especially legislatively. There have also what been government some... government is talking about doing? Well, government has done some things. Which is? SARS has been ended. Uh, judicial panels have been set up. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are sittings going on, and hopefully the reports will be communicated and given to the federal government to take appropriate action. Amen. Okay, those actions are going on. What kind of engagement? Because clearly from what you're saying now, it will look like the trust deficit between the people and you know, the youth. Uh, the government and the youth is gone, or is depleted. Mm -hmm. What kind of engagement do you think would persuade the young generation, especially the youth now, being the ones, you know, that pretty much raise these issues now. What kind of engagement do you expect and how should government be engaging them? Government should engage them the way fathers, mothers, the way elders will engage their children. They should stop trying to bully them. That's one thing. That's why I keep saying communication. They should stop trying to bully them. They should stop trying to think that the youth do not know what's happening or aren't intelligent. They are very. 
You know, the government needs to understand that these young people, this is 2020, we're moving on 2021. What some of these young people know today, even them, the government do not know it. You understand? So they need to, the government needs to be very transparent. The time has passed where you just come out and say, oh, we'll do this. And then that's it. Because people never forget. It's not, the only, it's not only the internet that never forgets. People never forget. You reeled out a couple of panels from 1960 to 2020 and not, that nothing came out of. So right now, a lot of young people are sitting at, at home, jobless, schoolless, because ASU is still doing the striking more than Zeus these days. So they're sitting at home and they're watching another panel, another sitting. Not what has come out from the other ones, nothing. So obviously a lot of them right now believe nothing will come out of this. So what the government needs to do, if there's enough from one of the panels, if there's enough proof, even if it's one or two officers that have been found guilty, let it be made public and let the prosecution process take, start taking place immediately. But we have had that, right? We have heard. We have had that. Who? You interface, you know, sizably with the police. Yes, you right. would know that, you know, the commissioner of police, for instance, in Lagos recently, you know, made an announcement of people who have been removed, dismissed. And we've also heard from the, you know, federal government at the federal government level the police at the center saying that these actions have happened not just in the in abuja city it ha they have happened in various states can and I, communities in the nation yeah just like you said we have heard they have said but we've not seen that's what i mean by communication we have been hearing and they have been saying for what years we want to see they have we need dismissed to see. some how do we know how do we confirm where do we go to be sure let me give you a quick example God rest his soul. Um, Colady Johnson was shot and killed by an officer um, last year. The case has been in court. It has been adjourned almost till today. But if a young Nigerian does, he's, is caught on the road, maybe with a small stick of a substance or something, he goes to court immediately and he's sentenced. You see, that's, you see the difference? Now, that's what I'm talking about. His, there's no evidence to prove that that was found on him. Mm -hmm. But the officer who shot Colored Johnson has even opened his mouth, confessed that he shot. And it happened in broad daylight. But the case is still in court over a year. I, you know, the, the sense that the government is given now is things are different. I mean, you've, seen the, you've talked about the judicial sense. panel. We don't but want sense. In the space of this past few weeks, I mean, from just before the NSAS protests, mm -hmm. during and after, because you talked about transparency, we'll go to break quickly, but I'd like no, to, to touch on that. You mm -hmm. talked about transparency. Is there anything you have seen in the space of this few weeks that has told you, well, maybe the government is not being transparent enough? Um, yeah, well, for the Lagos panel, I, there was a document that came out about, uh, they wanted them to not dis disclose anything that happens within the panel to the public. Now, why would you want to do that for a panel that's supposed to be for the people? The panelists refused, mm. and then it was struck up. Now, okay. that was not a good sign. Well, we'll, we'll, pr we'll probably need a lawyer to understand that, but then we'll come back <laughs> to it. No, the document was actually put out. It was yeah, on, I, 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 everyone, sorry, but we'll, let, let's yeah. take a break for now to take a few messages. We'll be right back to continue the conversation. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, well, this conversation is an ongoing one. Honorable Wauba, well, you have heard um, Michael Stevens, Mr. Michael Stevens, and um, one of the things that's underscored in all he has said is that the trust deficit is depleted. All people hear is, we're going to do it, and then, you know, Sometimes they even t it even takes off, and then within a short time, uh, we just seem to go back to square one. Again, the question, how do we rebuild that trust deficit between the people and the government? So, um, in the first place, um, all the interventions that you've seen in the past at police reforms have all been executive interventions, all of them. Um, what we are trying to do is to actually expand the base. We are trying to, first of all, cement the executive-legislative relationship 
we have had seminars with the executive, we have had interaction with the executive, we have all identified the need to be on the same page. And to the point I made earlier on, when you talk about police reforms, police reforms affect one and all. As long as you're a Nigerian, any institutional reform of the police force will likely affect you in one way or the other. And that's the point that I was making. In the composition of the, the, the proposal, the, in the draft bill, we have actually I've made just provision said now, for a youth. It, just a moment. A youth, yeah. oh, not uh, more uh, than uh, age uh, of 35. You will expatiate on that for a bit. Yes, just a moment. A you will expatiate on that. Just, just a moment, Honorable. Yeah. I was going to take you up on the fact that, you know, when you said it's uh, human rights against one, it's human rights against all, not just the youth. I agree. And you're about to expatiate the fact that, you know, the youth have also been, you know, factored into the conversations that you're having. But don't forget that over, the, over time, this matter of human rights abuses had been going on. There have been attempts to raise conversations about police reforms, especially because it's the younger people that seem to be a little more susceptible. There have been others, yes, but this issue was exacerbated recently by the youth in this country. That is why I'm asking, is there any engagement happening between government, especially from the National Assembly, and the youth? Because eventually, these youth will grow up out of the youth bracket. So is there any engagement now that is sustainable? Nothing will please this parliament more than this proposed engagement that you're talking about. What we have done is taken the initiative to commence a process with legislation. Of course, we're open to further uh, interaction with the youth in any, any way this, the, 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 the conversation can be structured and, and you know, can be had. On, over the weekend, we actually, preparatory to the event that we had yesterday on this uh, draft bill uh, seeking to reform the police, we actually had a Zoom meeting with all the, the youths that we could get into the database, into the, into the scope of the conversations that we're having. The House of Representatives is seeking to position itself as a pro-people house as a pro people uh, parliament we want to see uh, these kind of interactions that we can aggregate the, the collective opinions of the youths and use them in policy making we want to position the house of representatives as an engine room for innovation in policy we are available um, but right now the conversation on the table is what can we do in terms of the police reforms that will resonate positively with the youths. And we have not even started the bill making process, but we have expanded the, 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 the cycle to, to even start conversations and dialogues that will be meaningful at the end of the process. What the you needs. saw yesterday was a situation where we had a representation Honorable. from the youth body. Yeah. Uh, we understand the need to have a, a body of law backing these reforms. It's quite important. But we just had the, the Police Act, which was signed into law. And if you look at some of the provisions, you see that it's almost like a duplication of the ACJA. It's almost word for word. Now, if we're going to have the PSC reform bill, I believe uh, that's, that's what it is called. How different will it be from the Police Act, maybe the ACJA? Because over time, we've seen duplications, and you wonder... Just minute differences. So how much of a game changer will this be? This is a repeal and reenact act of the Police Act of 2001. What we seek to do is a structural amendment that will reflect and will see the changes in the way they conduct their uh, actions with particular emphasis on human rights abuses. What we're trying to achieve is to see a fair uh, level or terms of engagement, both for the police and for those that are being accused or, or, or the accusers. We think that when a policeman is killed in line of duty, it's unfortunate. A policeman, don't forget, is also a Nigerian. He has families, he has uh, uh, children, he has, he's, he's basically a human being. So we're trying to look at the issues from a balanced perspective and put in enabling legislation that will be fair for all. What this is strictly looking at is one, the way and manner that officers conduct themselves with regard to human rights abuses. We also want to see 
uh, a police complaint procedure that is independent, not just in intent, but on ground. We want to make it easier for Nigerians to bring their complaints out. So we are setting up 37 police uh, service commission offices across Nigeria. It is quite uh, unfortunate as it is today. You see uh, people coming in from outside of uh, station to travel long distances to make their reports. We also want to enable electronic ways of capturing uh, human rights violations, just like you have uh, in developed countries where you have uh, body cameras on policemen to capture crime as they are being committed or uh, violations as they are being committed. We want to be able to act uh, documentary evidences as well as electronic evidences. Uh, you can uh, record using your mobile phone or camera. In any way you gather the, the, um, the evidence, it will be accepted. We're right. also opening up the of institutions that can prosecute will include the EFCC, uh, the Attorney General of the States of the Federation. So if, if I got that uh, well, did you say, uh, Honorable, par pardon me, did you say that policemen might be having body cams? Is that what you said? No, what I'm saying is that we're trying to allow electronic uh, uh, evidences to be gathered so that if, if for, for instance, there's an incident on the street and somebody has a mobile phone and recording those mobile phones, that footage can be accepted and sent in. Uh, right. We haven't reached, uh, Nigerian police hasn't reached uh, the level where, you know, we can equip them with, with we have serious gaps in terms of uh, funding the, the police and all of that, but that's a different conversation. That's a huge issue but, also so about funding. That but, police reforms. Uh, pardon me. So we can do this, I mean, have a robust conversation. I understand Rugged Man uh, has to respond to some of the issues you have raised. I mean, he's also representative of the young people. So maybe these are some of the representations and conversations you would like uh, on that, your committee. So you've listened to some of the issues he raised. Yes. Do you want to respond? I, to I was just about to say, um, Honorable, you know that a hungry man does not know respect. An angry man does not know uh, rule of law or human rights. Where I'm taking this to is, I appreciate everything you said about um, what, you know, the plans you have for the police, but you've not touched on one very, very important part, and that's funding the police, their salaries, their health care, the education of their children, the accommodation where they live. These are things you have to put in place. These are things that determine the mentality of the police officer that gets on the street that people like myself and these young people meet every day. Yes, you're talking about how to punish the bad ones, but you've not said anything about rewarding the good ones. And then you've not talked about paying them what they're supposed to be paid properly. That's the funding part. And then uh, there's this, I'll quickly also give you this idea, which I've said a lot of times, both online and to some good officers that I know. You just said uh, Nigeria, hasn't, Nigeria hasn't gone to the level where it, uh, you can fund them enough to have body cams. I'm sorry, sir, but that is an embarrassing statement to make on national TV. We know how much Nigeria is worth. We know how much our budget is. If the security is not taken seriously enough to even give the police a body cam, come on. That's a serious issue. But to solve your body cam issue um, real quickly, I keep saying this. If you have a group, if you have a six-man, five-man squad that wants to go out for an operation, not, not an armed robbery shootout case. I mean, if they're going to investigate something or interact with somebody, Put a sixth man, let that sixth man's only job be to have a camera, to have a phone. It's easy to get. You have a small one. So that immediately they get to where they're going to, once they step out of the car, the, that the person starts recording and they state their names. I am so, 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 so. We're heading to see so, so, so. So they record every step till they interact with the person. If there's any resistance, they do, they handle the issue so that. That is video evidence, okay. so that when they get to the station, it is it not fine. just the officer's word against the I, 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 I'll take that as your, your, your recommendation on this matter. But uh, Honorable, very quickly, you want to react to that, so we can close. Um, first of all, the police reforms that is being pursued by the Ninth House of Representatives is a series of reforms. We have taken the first uh, reform that was signed by the President. We're proposing this reform now with the Police Service Commission. And the third uh, bill that is coming is actually looking at the welfare of the police, strictly and holistically, 100%.
I do agree with you. There are so much gaps in, in, in policing in, in Nigeria. Uh, but the point I was making was not uh, the point of uh, trying to embarrass Nigeria or embarrass the police force. We do need more funding to go into the police. We do need more equipment to go into the police. We do need, need more air, air cover. Nigerian police should have a, a thriving marine uh, water police air police, helicopters, body cams, more vehicles. I agree with all of that. What I am saying is that this particular bill is looking at infractions of human rights on ground, and we're saying we will accept a digital and electronic evidence in the absence of body cams on police, just like we have in other crimes. On the issue of welfare, I really think it's an embarrassment. We have had reports. Uh, let me just put this up. We have had reports of uh, policemen uh, uh, serving for maybe 10, 15 years with only one allocation of uniforms. We have had reports of policemen dying in active service and within uh, a few weeks, the family is evicted from, from, the, from the house where they're staying. We have had reports of the salary structure of the police. So we're coming with a comprehensive bill that will be a police welfare bill that is going to look at all of these issues. Where we have a lot to do from a legislative perspective, mm. but right. one thing I can assure Nigerians is that this house is poised, is willing, and is available. We are available as a committee to work Honorable. with you, rugged man. We work with your the youths. We are. Uh, we don't have all the answers. What we want Honorable, to do is we, we have only to we have only attempted to begin this conversation. And um, now that you have uh, made an appeal for rugged man to come join your committee, well, perhaps he will also be. You will also be contacting him afterwards. So we have to thank you very very much for your time. By the way. Um, uh, uh, there is an appeal that a number of people are making, uh, rugged man, uh, that the youth should please give government a chance. What appeal would you be making to the youth now? Just so that they can just give government a little bit of a chance to at least redeem some of the promises that they have made. I, don't, I actually don't think... Um, okay, well, well, let me put it this way. Communication, yes? Who's making the appeal? Who's making the appeal and how are they making the appeal? First, something I said, uh, first, second day of this, of the protest, I said, imagine if the IG of police had actually come on, TV, on air and announced that he was sending at least 100 or 200 policemen to each protest venue to protect the protesters. That would have been a great way because you know Nigerians, no matter how hard we want to say we are, we're still wonderful people. Okay. The next thing you see is pictures with... Of so for you, police. it is trust. It trust. Is communication. Communication. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, I have to thank you very much, uh, Michael Stevens, also known as Rugged Man. Thank you so much for your thank time. You. And Honorable Henry Wawuba, Chairman, Committee on Implementation and Monitoring of Legislative Agenda at the House of Representatives. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Thank you. We are back in a moment to take on another issue. Do stay with us. A year it has been just this year alone we've had to combat Lassa fever, COVID-19, and now yellow fever. Well, maybe we didn't see COVID-19 coming like a lot of other countries, but for Lassa fever, yellow fever, they're not new to Nigeria's health system. I mean, the NCT says over time, just this year alone, we've had seven, six people die across three states as a result of this disease. But the big question is, didn't we see this coming? I mean, what did we miss and how can we make it better? We have joining us two commissioners for health across two states that are uh, dealing with yellow fever currently in Nigeria. Dr. Onoye Mordi is a commissioner for health, Delta State. It's joined by Dr. Ikechukwu B, the commissioner for health in Enugu State. Good morning and thank you for joining us on Sunrise Daily. Well, well, this is a question for both of you, but I'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Modi. <sighs> Here we are again dealing with yellow fever and, I mean, people have died. It's really sad. And the first question a lot of Nigerians usually ask is, didn't we see this coming? I mean, this is not a time to throw around blame games and, and all that, but it's important to know how we dropped the ball, where we missed it. So regarding the case in your state, how did we get to this point? Now, um, we saw this coming. Let me, let me tell you how. Uh, there's, 
there was or there is a planned mass yellow fever va vaccination um, involving some states like Delta, which was programmed to begin about the um, 20th of November. So plans were already on ground, adequate plans were on ground to take off mass vaccination of every eligible Delta. And uh, this just came before them. And that is why, as we handle this phase in the uh, first two local government areas, we're already working towards um, uh, actualizing the plans we have for the rest to the three local government areas. And so the, there were plans before that, uh, just like these this cases came in um, um, earlier than, than when we were to begin the mass vaccination uh, campaign. Really this you know emergency activation once things happen once maybe a case a suspected case is discovered do you have such in your state oh yes um the moment we got the information what we did was um was um get into the community the community involved actually to try to uh, first of all engage with the community and be sure of what was going on it's not only the news came in as mysterious deaths, you know, so they thought, so, you know, those deaths were mysterious. Um, and as one of the reported, we went, we went to the community, had um, 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 mysterious with them, and then Jerry, thereafter, set up uh, the necessary machinery to deal with uh, what our suspicions were. We didn't think initially of, of, um, of any particular uh, um, um, Element. Because of the age bracket involved, you know, 15 to 25 years, most of them were ever thinking of substance abuse. We thought of uh, Lassa fever because we're about, you know, uh, the, 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 the masses of Lassa. We also had a threat on our mind of yellow fever. And so we set out trying to identify what was the uh, primary cause of these unexplained deaths. Audi, let me bring in Dr. Obi now, just to get his opening thoughts on this. I suspect you will also say you saw this coming, but people have died. So the question now is, what could you have done better, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, to maybe save those lives and ensure that the casualty was reduced? Okay, good morning. Yes, good morning. Um... um the truth of it is that we, we, we must understand that uh, when it comes to public health issues, uh, for example, yellow fever belongs to one of the diseases you call a disease of public health importance. And um, the truth of it is that there is always the emergency preparedness and response uh, uh, state for most ministries of health from the federal to the state level also. Um, when you are dealing with diseases that are endemic, sometimes even though you are, you are you are you are prepared. It doesn't necessarily mean that you might always be able to cover every single ground at all times. But you see, emergency preparedness is the key, so that once things uh, like this come up, then you can immediately. Um, Swing into action as much as is um, possible. Okay, uh, Dr. Obi, it's been quite tricky uh, catching your trail of thoughts there with the, you know, the network acting up. But we'll try to reconnect with you such that we can get what you're saying and, and make you know, some, some sense of what you're doing uh, in your state. But we'll go to break right now. We'll return, we'll take up some issues, especially as it concerns Kogi State. Yesterday, there was a controversy about the death toll. Is it in Kogi? Is it in Enugu? But we'll go on this break right now. When we return, we'll take on the issues. Please stay with us.
So, Dr. Obi, there's been that controversy uh, about the debts that were reported. Was it in Kogi State? In fact, a member of the State Assembly said over 50 people died in that particular community of Alamaboro. But the commissioner says that it happened on the Enugu side. So, trying to make sense, really, what exactly played out? Is it 50 people? Is it over 40 people? Did it happen in Kogi or in Enugu? If you can hear me, Dr. Obi. Obi, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I think it's much better now. So uh, let me just take the question again. I, I guess you probably didn't get my question. I'm asking, just yesterday, I mean, reports came out about uh, over 50 people dying of yellow fever in a particular community in Kogi State. The commissioner said, well, it didn't happen in Kogi State, that it happened in Enugu State, right? So we, we, we need to know 50 people, is it over 46 people? What exactly played out and which other communities have been affected? Hello, um, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so um, we, we, and they were in um, communities uh, in our, one of our local governments, it was a not local government. And those communities were Eteuno and uh, Umoku communities. Now they happen to share border with uh, with with Kogi states, and um, this activated our own emergency response. And when we now responded and connected with others, we discovered eventually through confirmatory tests that we are dealing with yellow fever. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, so we are dealing with yellow fever. And we have confirmed that it's yellow fever that we're having, and um, uh, it's we have we had reported cases on the Enugu side. Yes. How many cases? How many deaths have you recorded on the Enugu side? Now, if um, we for deaths, we have had reported right now from our situation reports. We have reported a large number of deaths in quite a large number of LGAs. But you see, these are, we are still calling them probable deaths, probable, probable deaths or deaths from probable cases of yellow fever because we have not confirmed that all these deaths were yellow fever related deaths. The number of deaths we can confirm as due to yellow fever are two deaths. Actually, two deaths that we can, we can confirm are from yellow fever. And we have confirmed 19 cases of yellow fever based, based on the PCR diagnosis and can only confirm two deaths from yellow fever. So the reports of strange deaths are, are ongoing. Now, there is, it's, it's very likely that a lot of the deaths we have reported out of the 187 may have been from yellow fever. But we cannot confirm that all of them are from yellow fever. So it's, it's better we can confirm the two deaths that we're sure from samples that were taken that are from. Specifically speaking, the communities that, are, that you, I mean, the, that share boundaries with Kogi State, with Olamabaro, how many suspected deaths or strange deaths have been recorded in the community that shares a border with Kogi, talking about the Olamabaro community? Dr. Obi, I uh, seem to be having a challenge with your connection. But, but we'll come back. We'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Hi. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Modi. Well, earlier you said that um, you saw it coming when my colleague asked you if we saw it coming, you know, that these deaths and all of that. Specifically, what did you see coming? Because down the line, you also say we, you didn't expect, uh, you didn't suspect initially any particular ailment, but that you saw it coming. What exactly did you see coming and when? Now, nationally, there are planned yellow vaccination campaigns to cover various states. And Delta states are amongst the states that will begin in um, uh, uh, November. And these plans were made because um, um, uh, over time, not, I think the, the last time we had a, a little uh, coming in Delta 
was in the mid 90s. So there was only a program, you know, to vaccinate so that people will not um, uh, 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 contact the virus. But like I said, the short contact was necessary. Just a moment, yeah. Doctor. I'm, I'm wondering why it was necessary to do a mass vaccination, given that what we have always known is that people are vaccinated for yellow fever at birth, and it's once in a lifetime. So at what point did we stop vaccinating such that 30 people have died as a result of uh, yellow fever in a Delta State? Uh, vaccinations begin from nine months. And I told you, uh, uh, the routine vaccination that they take, you know, in the uh, health centers. There, there are also uh, campaigns that you take to persons who may not have, you know, been exposed to vaccination. Like some some persons have behavior, um, uh, that, you know, makes them not to seek um, um, services like red, like routine immunization. And I told you the last mass vaccination was about um, uh, mid-90s. And if you look at the age range of those involved in this particular uh, 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 case, you see that they are most likely, they're most, they're most likely those who may have missed out the regular routine immunizations, maybe because of the health skin behavior of their parents. And so that, that, that's why, why uh, that would have happened. Now, vaccinating the entire population, of course, is very much um, um, uh, necessary to, to give us, you, you know, um, 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 what I call health immunity, and, um, and that is proper and, uh, and normal. And, you know, even the way we responded, the speed with which we responded was because we were, we were already preparing and so we leverage on the preparations we have made. If you know, there was otherwise... that significant response, Dr. Modi, um, from what we understand, there is a gestation period for yellow fever before it could get to the point of killing someone. We understand um, it takes something upwards about, of about a week or thereabout before someone yeah. could die of uh, yellow fever. If that is the case, and you say that the response was quick enough, how come we were able to get up to 30 people die in Delta if your response was quick enough? Uh, like the, initial, the communities thought that this mysterious death was because of other reasons. Reasons are due you know, to... Um, uh, uh, maybe or, Does that or mean your emergency answer. team didn't get there on time before they discovered the the people began to hallucinate about what it could be? By the time the information came to us, uh, I think we had about fifteen deaths. That was on the thirtieth of October, and by the thirty-first of October, we were in the community. By that thirty-first of October, we had already, uh, already began active case search. In, in the so. And even thereafter, there was quite some resistance from some of the communities who still felt that these were not medical issues. And, uh, and, and um, um, we led to, at that point in time, more robustly engage the community to enable us to have access. And, you know, in that intervening period, persons that could have also been surveyed lost their lives. And so it wasn't the fault of the medical system. But issues that had to do with with, belief, with the belief system in uh, in uh, some of the communities. Okay, I think we have Dr. Obi back now. As we wind down on this conversation, I was asking earlier, Dr. Obi, that how many deaths were recorded, strange, unaccounted for deaths in that border community with Alama Baro in Kogi State. How many strange deaths were recorded on your side of that border? Yes, I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, so, so for, for, for the number of deaths, I have said that to determine the numbers of strange deaths, yes, I, the initial reports were of 50 and above, the numbers of strange deaths. And like Dr. Modi has said, the issues of health-seeking behavior are real. And a lot of times, we have 
an emergency reporting network that has to deal with the health system. If people do not report to healthcare to the healthcare system in the primary healthcare facilities, at least, it becomes difficult for the um, for infectious diseases surveillance and response to be initiated. So a lot of times it's health seeking behavior of people that has to do with a lot of things. Belief systems, people stay away from hospitals thinking that they will get better care from herbalists and from patent medicine vendors sometimes. So, but if they do not report to the health center, it's difficult to determine that um, a particular type of illness. That is why the first report we had from Enugu State was that we were dealing with strange deaths that the symptoms resembled diseases of public health important. Then we right. went ahead to, dis to determine what particular disease we were dealing with. All right, uh, Dr. Ikechiko B, the Commissioner for Health in Enugu State, thank you so much for your time, as well as Dr. Onoye Modi, the Commissioner for Health in Delta State. We'd like to appreciate you and we wish you the very best in this battle. <laughs> Well, let's turn our attention to a matter that has been trending for a while now, and it concerns pensions for ex-governors and their deputies, maybe especially the ones that are now holding political offices or appointments. Don't forget, the Lagos State Governor made that announcement, and now we have the Kwara State Government also. In fact, that, that, that particular law was submitted just yesterday at the State Assembly. So we'll be speaking uh, with the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice in Kwara State in a moment, just to get a sense of what that law is about, some controversies that were raised and what it means in general for the state. But that's in a moment. Please stay with us. The Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, Kwara State, Salman Jawando, joins us this morning via Zoom. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. So, Thanks for having me. Great to have you. So this law, I mean, started in 2010. We hear it was amended in 2018. But ju just before you give us, I mean, the contents, what to expect, there was just... There was a controversy in recent times about this law, uh, former governor's aide saying, well, this was done in 2018. What are you doing this time around? And it seems as though there was a back and forth. So what exactly happened from 2010 to 2018 and now? Well, I thank you very much. The statement by and aid to former governor to the fact that that law has been, I may, I may repeal in 2018, does not represent the position of things. In fact, the law still remain extant in Kwara State. The only thing that happened in 2018 was an amendment. And that amendment came as a result of public heart cry that the former governor in Kwara State, who was also in the Senate and later became Senate president, was Hannibal that pension under the law, the provision or the pension provided for under the law, and at the same time taking salaries and allowances in the National Assembly, which is wrong. So it was as a result of that outcry that they now sent another bill to the House to amend the law to the extent that the beneficiary, that's a former governor, deputy governor, will not take pension under the law as for, long, for so long as he is in another office, either appointment or elected, elected and still had his salary. That is just the amendment that was made in 2018. Now, the background fact of this matter is that in 2003, the Quara State had enacted a law that's the governor, deputy governor pension law. The provision of that law is limited to the governor, the former governor or former deputy governor, handing the basic salary of the incumbent governor or deputy governor for life. That is just the provision of the law. It was in 2010 that this law was now escalated to what we have today, to the level of obscenity. Incidentally, I was privileged to be the MBA chairman at that time, and the MBA persisted and provide serious argument against the bill that it amounts to abuse of the constitutional provision that even allows the state mm -hmm. assembly to make law to provide for pension or gratuity because that's the language of the constitution pension or gratuity so you can't have the two so what we now have in that law 
was a combination of the two and at autopsy level. But despite that, it was passed. And so later, that amendment came. So that's the position of the law in Kwara State as of today. There was an amendment, right, in 2018. So what is different now with what you're introducing in 2020? What is different from what happened in 2018? Yeah, what is happening now? When this got involved, it was one of the issues that was even discussed at the transition committee level, the desirability or otherwise of the existence of that law, continuous existence of that law. And the recommendation was that something be done about the law. So there were divided opinions. Some people believe it should be outrightly repealed. Some believe it should be amended. So when the governor came on board, that was now subjected to consultations and debates. In fact, we had to go to consider other same law in other states like Niger, Kaduna, and uh, Kogi. And we discovered that the only one that appears a bit reasonable is that of Kaduna, which is equivalent to the 2003 law of Kwara State. So now, that thing has to be subjected to consultation. And so the product of the consultation is, is now what is happening, that the law be repealed heartrightly. Because from our findings, not only that law was an abuse of legislative power, it also contained obscene provisions that provide leakage, that provide room for leakage in the treasury of the, of the state. And in fact, it is a serious hemorrhage on the finances of the state. If you don't mind, I will tell you a, a, a few of the provisions. Apart from the salaries that the governor, to that. the former just, governor we have. Just a moment, uh, Honorable Commissioner. Um, you, we have seen some of those provisions in the slides that we have been putting on your screen. But um, you would also remember, I'm sure you do, that um, a civil society organization went to court on, you know, the similar case as this one and in a, re, in a letter to the Attorney General, they appealed that in enforcing the judgment of the court that said that no governor should earn double pay if that governor or the de former governor and former deputy governor are still in public office. They appealed that the Attorney General of the Federation should look into the possibility of or the validity or otherwise of those laws, perhaps just as you also did as well. Are you saying that this move by Kwara State government is not in response to that judgment of the court or the action or a memorandum from the Attorney General of the Federation that that law be repealed? No, our action is not based on a memorandum or a position of the Federal Attorney General. You see, the issue of this law is provided for the Constitution that enables the State Assembly to make law for pension or gratuity for former governor and deputy governor. So it's not a question that the Federal Attorney General will issue a directive on. It's a question that will be tackled at state level by individual states. Yes, yeah, but you also know that so when Serap went to court, when, when Serap went to court on that matter and got that judgment, the judge ruled that the Attorney General of the Federation, which proved the same case as you are proving right now, the, attorney, the judge ruled, the judgment you know, included the fact that the judge said, look, whether or not it is a state law, it is the duty of the Attorney General of the Federation to ensure that whatever law is passed at the state level conforms state with level. the Constitution, with the laws and all of that. So that's why I'm asking yes. if indeed... There isn't any conversation or communication from the office of the Attorney General before this action of yours. No, there is no conversation or communication from the office of the Attorney General. Like I said, our own is a product of long-term consultation. And I gave you the background at the transition committee level, even before the governor was sworn in. And so that was escalated to consultation and uh, comparison of the position. And then our experience in Kwara State with respect to the implementation of that law itself. Because what we had in Kwara State is 
the law was even escalated to the level of criminality where an individual got two properties in Quara State in the name of one pension law. One, the official guest house of sitting governor was converted and given to that individual, that Dr. Bukolasaraki, as pens under the pension law. That property is situated on a plot of land of over 20 plots of land. Now, later, under the same law, another building of 253 million naira was built in the name of a company, Calisto Investment Limited. And all manners of criminality were involved. They jettisoned the provisions of public procurement law that required that such things should be advertised. They just did selective country and using quarter money to build house for somebody in the name of a company. So we now look at it that not only the law was not in compliance, it was not with what was in the contemplation of the constitution. The provisions are not only obscene, but it has been abused. And plan. So the best. Yeah. Honorable Sir? Commissioner, is there a plan to get back some of those funds from the previous governors? Because no, I mean, if this law is repealed, what's that mean? Because uh, it is obvious that uh, we have to take steps to do something about this. Like I said, somebody cannot have two property under one law. It's not possible. Is there a so plan that's why there? We look at yes. That. You haven't answered the question. You're, yeah, there's you're, a plan. Okay. There's an ongoing plan. So with this repeal now, it means that both former governors and their deputies, whether they hold an office or an appointment at the same time, would not be getting any form of pension or emolument. Is that what this repeal means? I can I can hear you well. The question is, with this repeal now, does it mean that all the former governors and their deputies, whether they hold an appointment or an office, whatever or not, would not be getting any yeah, pension that, or emolument from no now henceforth? Yes, once the law once the assembly passes the bill, which has been sent to the assembly, then they will not get anything. Under no, the I, under the pension law, there will be no pension law in Kwara State again for governor and deputy governor. Okay, even for the ones that don't have an office or an appointment currently, right? Yes, that is the effect of total repeal of the law. So, which means when the current governor leaves office, he will not be entitled to anything. either a pension, gratuity, cars, uh, SSS operatives, furniture, and all that. Is that what that means? Yeah. Yeah, you will not be uh, legally entitled to such things. So, is there so what the constitution does not uh, even mandate the assembly to make those? It says may the mm -hmm. assembly may make. It's not compulsory that you must have those such law. So, what kind of package then would governors get when they leave office? Would would there be anything whatsoever given to those governors when they leave office? As a public officer, the remuneration, the severance. Everything is regulated by the uh, RAMFA. That is Revenue Mobilization and Biblical Allocation Committee. I mean, Commission. They make recommendation with what each political office holder will get while leaving the office. That should be enough for any public officer. After all, public office is supposed to be a service. So, so does this apply it's not also? That somebody, somebody who was not in full employment just for temporary period will now continue to live on the state for the rest of his life. Right. So does this apply also to uh, the speakers, their deputies? Was there ever any type of arrangement for them also? No such arrangement in Quara State. Right, so this process, I understand that the process has begun at the State Assembly. So when is the earliest possible time? Because, yes, of course, there's a legislative process, but how much of a buy-in do you have from the State Assembly? How much of a buy-in do you have from the State Assembly to ensure that this passes? And when is the shortest possible time to ensure that this repeal is passed? Well, you see, like I said before, it's a product of consultation, wide consultation, and that included the members of the House of Assembly particularly the leadership of the House. So it is a common ground among the executive and the legislature and based on the position of the people of Kwara State. So I don't expect that the W will have any problem passing through.
All right. Well, we'll keep our eyes on that, but we'd like to thank you so much, uh, the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, Kwara State, Salman Jawando. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on that critical Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, before we go, it's only fair we allow you to have your say. And um, the first, well, there are a number of tweets, you know, in response to some of the issues that have been raised. This first one from Goke. It says, the only way to gather evidence is the use of body cam by the Nigerian security forces, just like it is obtainable in the developed world. What does it cost for us to implement it that has become so difficult to do? I just wonder. Really? <laughs> okay. I, I understand that agitation, but if you take a look at how much it will cost, then maybe that's what it will cost us. But then if you see the benefit of that cost, then maybe it makes that cost make sense. But you know what? It's in the hands of a government. This one is from uh, Zhong Wei. says that, uh, still on body cam actually, says, shocking to hear a sitting House of Assembly member voice that police are not ready for body cam. I see you stepping on the leash and preventing the police from moving forward. Well, still on the police, now is the time to review what motivates them to act so outside the shores of our country, and that's talking about the police, and what demoralizes them at home. At home. Then act. That's from Dimple. Oluwak Benga Orukotan, it's also on police, says the state police that uh, has a state legislative backing and also answerable to the governor with statutory power to protect lives and property. Each state's police is tailored, designed for each state criminal peculiarity, culture, norms, and demographic issues. He's talking about state police and some of the merits this will have uh, on security architecture, right? Hopefully we'll get to that conversation one of these days. But that's the conversation, well, all of the issues that have been brought up today. We have to thank you very much for your time and thoughts and trust that you will have a great day and it will be a productive one for you. Let the conversations continue. I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful day. And I'm Kairo Kikiru. Thank you as always for joining us.